you are a group of blockchain veterans passionate about simplifying your journey in crypto. We understand the complexities that come when diving into the world of blockchain. But no worries, Komodo is here to assist you. Visit komodoplatform.com slash guide and grab our free Getting Started with Crypto resource. With us, you will learn how to manage your crypto assets without depending on third parties. Prioritize security and ensure you never lose your crypto. This episode and the resources on commonplatform.com slash guide will provide the answers you seek. Now, let's dive into today's episode. We are going to be talking about art, design, NFT, and AI. And I'm joined by two concept artists. So first up, we have uh, Raymond. And Raymond has worked on Ubisoft as a concept artist before. And today, he's working for Komodo. So all the illustrations you see, all the Komodians and the beautiful artwork, that's coming from Raymond. So hello, Raymond. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Otto. Excited to talk to And then we also got uh, Fabio. And, and like like Raymond, he's also worked in Ubisoft. And and today Fabio is working as a freelance concept artist uh, specializing in environment and prop design. So yeah, so welcome. Hi Otto, thank you for inviting me. I would like to start this first off by kind of getting a little insight into the in the world and mind of uh, of an artist. It's a kind of an intriguing field for me. So I'm curious to hear, like, how did you get started with art and, and design, like maybe at a young age, like, was there something particular that happened? Like, what took you interest and what got you to the path of to becoming a concept artist working for Ubisoft? I've been interested in art for as long as I can remember. My brother and my mother, they were drawing as well. And I was always just drawing, basically. And then when I was about like, I don't know, 18 or something, I came across, well, I mean, before that, I came across a lot of amazing art, including anime and comics. But then I came across like concept art and concept art was really interesting because it was basically a way to get paid for designing worlds and and designing functionality for those worlds. And I was like, wow, this could be a dream. And one of the first artists was Feng Zhu that caught my attention. And that's also somebody that Fabio studied under later. Um, and when I realized all that, I was like, yeah, this is my path. And I did everything in my power to become a concept artist. And like more than a decade later, I achieved my dreams that I and the goals that I set at the time. Worked at three or four major studios. And and now it's a little bit time for me to move on to different things. And that's why I'm working at Komodo. Yeah, I also started at a very young age to draw. Um, I guess the the very first contact with art was uh, with my mom. We used to paint little mandalas, uh, just fill in color. And uh, then I generally didn't take much interest in other subjects in school. So especially after I went to the gymnasium in uh history class or physics i would zone out quickly and take out my sketchbook and start drawing and uh, my first contact with concept art though must have been a video game called uh, warhammer online age of reckoning it was a very cool game uh, that unfortunately was discontinued but i got the collector's box back then which included a art book full of concept art uh, some very skilled artists and my attention was immediately caught. I was like, wow, this is a job. Is this, is this something real? And that's when I started looking into it, researching it. And I found uh, Feng Zhu that Ramon mentioned earlier, who um, has a channel on YouTube basically showing different techniques and talked about the concept art in general and the industry. And uh, I started to watch his videos and learned that he has a school in Singapore that he founded. And uh, well, at some point I talked to my mom about it. I was like, hey, you know, I would really like to do that. I didn't have my hopes up because it sounded crazy. And uh, to my big surprise, she was actually open to it. And she was like, hey, if this is what you want to do, let's get you to Singapore. And uh, she paid a very expensive school tuition of a year. 
And yeah, I went over there and started my journey and it, it was amazing because it felt like exactly the right thing that I wanted to do. It was a lot of hard work to get into, especially after the school also to, to build the portfolio and get your foot in the door of the industry. But even now, like 10 years later after the study, like I never regretted the decision. Yeah, that's pretty much how it began. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, in school, I was also kind of into into some sort of drawing and art a little bit, but I never pursued that passion. Um, and I, I felt like kind of the the school and the world around me didn't really even validate that, that would be like an actual profession you can enter into. And I think, Fabio, you kind of answered that a little bit al- al- already. So, so I would like to ask, like, what was the turning point for you when you realized that like, it started as a passion project? And, and, and then at what point did it turn into realization that you can actually turn, it, turn this into a career and make um, money with it? Well, the hope that I could make money from it was there from the beginning, because as I said, like I didn't really resonate with, with other things that I learned in school much. So I was already hoping that I could do something art related. And once I saw that um, that is an actual profession and I heard uh, the aforementioned thing um, talk about how it's a good career if you get good at it, um, it started to become realistic. And with the, with the foundation of the education, yeah, it became something real and something I wanted to pursue. How about you, Raymond? How did it happen for you? Um, well, I discovered that basically concept art is linked to the game industry. And the game industry obviously generates a lot of money. So it was actually pretty easy for me to make that realization that, okay, those worlds need to be designed, those levels need to be designed, and those immersive experiences again need design so it was pretty obvious that there was a way in and since i was already passionate about art um it was just putting one and one together and freaking go for it you know and that's what i did and when i got that first job i was really in heaven i mean i was very young i walked into a studio i saw was an outsourcing studio called streamline studios and i saw people left and right of me working on unreal 3 doing concepts for that and and everybody was so amazing and so good it was just mind-blowing you know so you know it's like uh, you have a dream and then suddenly the dream becomes reality and you see people that are way better than you and you're just a rook and and then the journey just keeps going on and it's beautiful i i don't regret for a second that i chose this path yeah i think the key there is that that you find your passion and then you are able to turn that in, into a living, into some, some sort of a value that you are able to provide for others. And, and for you guys, it has been the, the concept art. And you both ended up working with Ubisoft. So t- tell us a little bit about that experience and um, how, did, how did you like it? Uh, did you learn something? How did, how did that experience go? Um, I mean, for me, Ubisoft was not that different from other game studios I worked at in principle. Um, It was a good experience. It was more focused on the production side of concept art in terms of, you know, making prop design, making specific house designs and and so on. Uh, Other game studios I worked at, it was a little bit more widespread. It was more about creating the general vision of the games. So you could create mood concepts and communicate visions of what the general aesthetic would be. And in Ubisoft, it was a bit more executive in the sense that we were targeting specific uh, functions and specific um, uh, designs. Yeah, for me, it was a it was a trip to get there, to be honest, because I just after I finished school, I worked in my portfolio for two years and uh, my mom was growing uncomfortable because I chose this crazy career path and didn't make any money yet, didn't have any job yet. It was still this unreal thing. And I actually started a job in Switzerland first in a VFX studio that was about medicine and uh, doing 3D art, not really concept art. But I kept working on my portfolio and I saw this job opening for Ubisoft Blue Byte. And I went for it, gave it my all for the, for the art test. And, uh, and I managed to, to get into the, get this internship. 
and uh, it was it was a dream come true for sure like just being there with these people as Ramon describes similarly with his first job it's so cool to meet others who are doing the job already much better than you is very inspiring and uh, the experiences at the studio was simply cool like the the jobs were were fun the working atmosphere was light the there was like a good communication between co-workers you know we would hang out after work and stuff and do sports together and drink beers together and stuff and it, it was just an all-around great experience that is great to hear and now it's time to move to the main segment of the talk and bring in the, the ai we have seen kind of the really the the fast progression and then kind of the raise in popularity and awareness about the, the ai that is coming and i have also been testing it also like all kind of AIs including the design and graphics generators so that's just I just give it like a prompt and they provide me with, with an image so the big question is like you two being a designer as a professional artist how do you see this as a tool like are you planning on using it on, on your work like do you see that there's some productivity enhancement for you like are you for it or against it <laughs> okay just give me a minute on that one <laughs> otherwise yeah, i'll sure. start yeah so like i don't use it as a tool yet um i've seen a lot of ai art on instagram um all mid-journey stuff i don't i'm not aware if there's actually another player in the game ai wise that is as big as mid-journey but uh, the mid-journey art to me is mind-blowing i love it it's it's just I mean, it has a certain style. It can do many different styles, right? But there's still a certain aesthetic to AI art, and it pleases me. I really like it. I didn't get into it uh, in terms of workflow because the job of a concert artist is usually complex enough with the tools and the design tasks for me to really now introduce another tool that is gonna stir up the whole workflow shall i say in such a big manner that i will basically have to rethink the whole thing um i usually can't afford that when i'm on a job i just don't have the time to do that and also in a way i'm not so interested because i like my workflow as i have it so far with traditional drawing using photos using 3d um but i can see it potentially becoming uh, a huge tool inside a concept artist workflow now that being said like my only gripe with it if you ask if i'm for or against it my only um concern with it is really money so if you're like an instagram artist quote unquote artist you're making like mid-journey art and you're posting it uh, for people to enjoy uh, i have zero issues with that i think that's nice it's it's cool to enjoy uh, however like I've seen stuff on YouTube, for example, there's this like young 18 year olds putting out tutorials to uh, make a quick buck by using mid journey and some other tools to make uh, some album cover art or some um, book cover designs. And you can upload them to, to this website and everything. And he just streamlined the workflow to kind of start making cash with it. And that's where I start to have an issue with it because the data that the AI uses is built on the work from other people, which, you know, is technically copyrighted. Now, from a legal sense, AI is clear because it's changed it so much that you can't trace it. However, the work has already been done and the people who then profit off of that don't have to do that work. It has already been done for them, basically, by other people. And that, I think, is a problem. I think I'm gonna leave it at there for now. Um, yeah, there's so much to say about this that it's a little bit overwhelming almost. There's so much to unpack here. So I almost have to choose a random beginning. Um, I mean, let me maybe start with with the tool part. You know, is it useful for me? Um, I would say definitely not useful for me at the moment. Uh, I've been playing around with Adobe Firefly and, you know, I'm I'm throwing in these prompts and and it's like a slot machine it's like i get six results i don't like them but i like 
a fraction of each one of them, you know, and then I have to press the slot machine again. And then it's like completely different results. And then three hours later, I'm still playing the slot machine game, you know? So that's for me very crude. So that's not me being an artist. That's me playing a slot machine. And okay, let's say I had a dream and I go to a dope firefly or I go to mid journey and I start to prompt. It's like, okay, there is a there is a monster behind some trees. So first of all, the trees it generates are not the same trees I have in my dream. The the background is not the same. The mood is the same. So it's like, yeah, I get an approximation based on a description, but it's not what's in my mind. You know, like a human being is intelligent. It's complex. It, it has a specific mood. And then if I have to generate that mood through the violation of words, in order to get a result, it's 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 like basically taking a hammer and start smashing button. You know, it's it's not it's not being an artist. Like I'm sorry, it's it's just very crude. Now, if I extrapolate that to the future, and I would be like, okay, like imagine like an AI UI in this right, where you have many sliders and and many ways to manipulate like your image and like reposition things and like reallocate and, you know, like do all kinds of amazing stuff where the tool is basically like a matrix that you can like tune into and like start creating images. Then I would say like, okay, we're back in the artistic domain. We have control. We, we, we can, we can make this happen. But right now it's almost an insult, you know, but, if I look at where we're going potentially, yeah, then I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, that's cool. So another, like outside of the legality and outside of the appropriation of artists' work and all that stuff, I was talking to a friend of mine from Ubisoft. He was the best painter there. I'm not going to mention his name. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, Fab. Uh, so I was at a, at a party or something. We were talking a little bit about AI and he was like, yeah, you know, um, I'm I'm thinking about uh, the future and about what job I could do. And I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, well, you know, I won't be able to do what I love doing. And I, I still didn't quite get it. I was like, well, you know, even if AI is going to, you know, take center stage, you will just have to adapt and become a prompter or, you know, prompt technician or manipulator or whatever you want to call it. And he said, like, look, that's that's indeed part of the problem. It's like um, it's about my vocation. Like, I love digitally painting. I love that traditional aspect of celebrating images and creating worlds. And I love putting down the strokes that come directly from my heart, come directly from my soul and my life experience. And if I have to replace my vocation, my celebration, my job, my my love in what I love doing in life with with basically like becoming an engineer or becoming an art director or whatever, it you're basically no longer have that vocation, you know? So it's like he's literally thinking about completely different jobs like gardening or like whatnot, you know? And and I'm like, wow, you know? So you know, when, when people say like, you know, artists should just suck it up and adapt and go with it and join the revolution. It's like, it's like, that's all fine and dandy, you know, but in the end of the day, it does mean we have to give up our vocation, which is that we love painting, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, the human, uh, human beings should stay in the age of cave painting or something like that. But I'm saying there is something to be said about just enjoying traditional art. And when that leaves, what are we left with? We're left with the possibility to still do that, but in a niche of niche, you know, we will have to literally like seek out companies that still will accept concept artists, that still will accept traditional painting because the mainstream will be uplifted by AI generated art and, and art directors. So that's like one concern I have is that we are losing a craft. We are losing a vocation. And that's that's just a little bit sad in terms of career. That's like one perspective. That, that's an excellent point. And that made me think about all the things that technology has come in the recent years and how it has affected our skills and ability to do things. As an example, I will point out just the keyboard that we don't no longer really think about, but 
really like people cannot really write anymore. The writing is not that beautiful that most people write because we don't write anymore with a pen and pencil. It's just all keyboards and technology has kind of entered. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing when we think of this in terms of art, how it's going to kind of degrade the ability of people to paint and be creative. It's, it's all going to be just recycling the old. And in my mind, it's going to be leading to, to kind of like average results and everything's going to be kind of blending to the same thing in, in the world. So maybe in the future, we see whatever movie poster, advertisement, maybe they're all or less going to be looking the same, it's created by the same engine, <laughs> recycling the same work that was one day put by real designers in. And that, that's, that's kind of what I want to go back to mentioning that this was an important point, that AI cannot really create anything new, that it can just recycle what was put, put in place before. And the argument I have heard made is that uh, the AI today, they haven't, they don't have the permission to actually use the concept art and the artwork from other people, but they were just kind of scrapped from the internet and used to train the AI. So have you guys looked at that? And what are your thoughts on this kind of ethical dilemma? Like, am I right saying that? Yeah, I would say so. I think um, the issue is that you're dealing with millions of individuals who uploaded their art online. And technically, we have a copyright on those images, right? Um, if you compare that to, let's say, five, six hundred years ago, you know, if a thief would go into, let's say, Da Vinci's studio and steal his painting and run away with it um, and then go into another city and sell it, that would be a, a, a unique painting. It's gone now, right? While in the digital age, you don't have that anymore. Things can be copied, right? If I upload something on ArtStation, people can just save that image with people's art online the, the problem is like nobody's gonna sue ai we just can't because you can't go and trace your image in the ai's work but if we would compare that to let's say an ai would make a design of cars and it would take the data from mercedes from tesla you know porsche it would somehow have access to that data and it would mash up a new design like they will get sued to hell, you know, like it, there would be no way they could get through with it. And here it's kind of the issue because it's just individuals who usually don't have the money to go in and sue and they can't trace it back exactly to their specific artwork. And it's too many individuals. So there's just no legal base to come in and do something about it. But technically it's, it's a uh, theft. It's just like, I don't like calling it that way when you're just like using this machine to, to make, as I said, some pretty pictures on Instagram. I don't really care because you can always argue that the machine is doing the same thing as a human being, looking at other people's art, absorbing it, looking at pictures, and then mixing it together into something new. Now, humans are much more sophisticated in that manner because... We don't just incorporate images into new imagery. We also incorporate feelings, smells, memories, sounds. They can all influence us to, to create a new image, while the AI for now just uses pictures. But essentially, it's, you know, taking data and, and turning it into something new. So you can't flag it and saying, it, hey, that's wrong that it's doing that. It's like, yeah, we're kind of all doing that. However, the difference is, a human being, especially an artist, needs to earn money with their art. AI doesn't, right? And AI kind of just has the immediate skill of an artist that worked for 10, 15 years. And anybody, even people who never did drew anything as, as a stick figure, can now use that and immediately have that skill level that is based on other people's work and make money with it. So yeah, I think the, the making money part is really the issue there. So I have a follow-up thought on, like, let's talk more about the, the copyright itself. Mm -hmm. And that there's an interesting aspect to, to AI art, which is that they don't actually have a copyright. So when, when, we, when I go there and use AI to generate image, it has no copyright according to the current understanding and legal terms by courts. Makes sense. And this actually goes back to an interesting story uh, about... Um, nature photographer 
who went in to live with monkeys and designed a camera that could take selfies. So gave the camera to a monkey and then the monkey was taking selfies. And then Wikipedia decided to publish these images as in public domain, like there's no copyright because monkey took. And then there was a court uh, battle like, uh, about this. And it's actually the monkey, well, let's say the monkey won. Uh, it was decided that the photo wasn't taken by a human being and thus it doesn't have a copyright. And there's a whole Wikipedia article about this that you can go and read. It's called Monkey Selfie Copyright Dispute. And I think it's based on this that also the, why AI also doesn't have a copyright because it's the same issue again, like it wasn't ge- generated by, by a human. And, and to me, this, this kind of, it's also interesting because if I'm generating AI images and I'm using them for my business, it means that anyone can legally steal my business artwork. So do I, as a business, do I want to do that? Do I, like, maybe I shouldn't use the AI, especially if I'm a big business, like maybe this generates additional problems for using AI art. So perhaps there's still some hope for actual designers who, who yeah. actually make some artwork. I, I think, I think um, an important point is maybe this aspect of using, you know, like the art of millions of people is in that data set. Now, whatever happens in between before that original image gets created in the end, it's like it cannot happen without using that data. So whichever narrative you want to come up with, like whether it's like diffused and rebuilt and dreamt up, like in the end of the day, that end result cannot exist without that image being used in the data. So for me, that almost solidifies the argument that, you know, if you're going to monetize by using images mm. from other people what does that say about the, what does that say about copyright what does that say about uh about integrity and i think that's the real question because images are being used and this is the main that we're talking about. and uh it's for me it's not exactly the same as, as a human being because again like you can really obsess about like how those images are being used but they're still being used and and that use case is being monetized. So that's the problem in a way. I think it's simply something that we as a society don't know yet how to deal with. It's too new and it's a little too complex to put a stamp on it because the creation of the AI itself is legal. And because there's no copyright on the images, it's also fine to to create them and put them online. Now, if somebody makes an AI created image and uses and monetizes it, for example, puts it on an album cover, right? A band, instead of paying an artist to make an album cover for them, decides to use Mitchell. And then the art has a part in selling that album. And uh, like, once you do that, like, how are you going to find out that it's AI art, first of all? And who's going to complain that? That's the issue, right? That we got to sell. Like we can sit here and say like, well, it's not cool. It's kind of theft. But who's going to complain? Like who's going to implement the system that figures out whether uh, AI art was used to be monetized and who's going to get money, right? <laughs> like how, how are you going to punish that? How are you going to prevent that? Those are all questions like I personally don't have an answer for. Um, maybe some kind of digital tags will have to be the answer that we attach to any file, which, you know, brings a whole set of other issues. Uh, you know, NFTs then come to mind and it's like, wow, NFTs are crazy energy inefficient. And yeah, it's, I think we're just as a society right now, overwhelmed with the issue, even though we see it as well. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of question marks. Definitely. It's a, it's a disruptive and it's kind of developing this just a fast pace that we are trying to understand it and look at it and, and but I think this has so far the discussion here has been very helpful I think from for most people to kind of get up to speed on on the issues and, and what's going on with AI especially when it comes to design and art aspect but Fabio you, are, you mentioned NFTs so so let's jump into kind of shift the gears a little bit and talk about the, the NFTs and I think we can then loop it back to the AI at the end but yeah like I'm curious to hear kind of your designer perspective on the NFT art and and how much you follow that space and what you think about it. And, and there's been like, for example, I, I, I first heard about CryptoKitties back in the day that, that made me kind of aware of the NFT space, but there's 
Nowadays, there's a lot of different collections from CryptoPunks to Bored Apes and all kind of things that you can buy digitally and then have the ownership of that picture. So what, as a designer and artist, like what, what are your thoughts when, when you saw the NFT space and kind of how it was booming? Like, what do you think of the NFT art? Like, because I'm looking at it and it's pretty simple. Let's so put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I first discovered, I think a year ago, there was this big boom of it in, in summer, or maybe it's already two years. Um, I got aware of it by Beeple's art, actually, right? I think he made the most money with it. And initially, the idea was very exciting that you would have a royalty of like 5 to 10% every time the NFT would be would change ownership. Um, that sounded like it would put a lot of power into the artist's hand. And it kind of got around, um, kind of sounded like an antidote for AI art because NFTs, um, to go back to the example of 500 years ago, you now suddenly have a unique piece again. And uh, yeah, that made it very exciting in the in the beginning, and I followed it. Now, what shocked me um, after a couple months is is when I discovered how much energy it takes to mint an NFT. I I was flabbergasted when I heard that minting three NFTs, I could basically with that power, I could use my apartment for a year, <laughs> and. And I run my PC every day for hours with like an 800 watt like uh, power uh, power supply. It's like <laughs> that's a crazy amount of power for like a little monkey, you know, twitching a bit. And uh, that kind of it didn't turn me off the idea. However, I started to have this idea that hey, if you're not an artist that has at least 10,000 followers on Instagram please don't make NFT because you're making it to try to make money and you're using the power to create it. So like, please, like you need to have a proper chance of actually selling it and actually be able to resell. Then it's okay. You know, still a lot of power, but at least you're making something out of it. But if you're just like some random Joe making an NFT is like, and it's sitting there and you use all that power to make that monkey and like nobody cares because there's, <laughs> other monkeys there or whatever that's a bit of a ethical issue environmental issue i feel like but um honestly i feel like the wind got a little bit out of the whole thing because it's it's really like it pushed it pushed the uh, art into back into like this gallery mindset where in galleries art gets just treated like an asset right it's an investment asset you put money into it so that you can get more money out of it later. And NFT really works the same way if you want to make cash with it. Yes, it becomes a collector's item, but it's also an investment, right? If somebody pays 50K for, for a piece of NFT, chances are they want to make that money back at some point or even more than that. Um, and that's just not for everybody. That's for one. So I think NFT, like the target group, is uh, is not very mainstream in that sense and uh yeah so so i just after a while i kind of stopped following the space because i saw like okay i don't have ten thousand followers on instagram i'm not gonna make an nft and uh yeah there's just no use for it for me right now but i'm curious to see where it goes on um i'm a little surprised i never put out an nft yet uh, I have worked for different companies making some NFTs. I don't know if they've been released or not, but um, it's interesting. Like at first it was very interesting because it was a legit way for artists to make some extra money and to bank off their own art in a very cool way, uh, as Fabio described with the royalties. And I thought it was brilliant when I first found out about it. Um, fast forward to today, I mean, the hype died down a little bit it might still be very active i'm to be honest i'm not that up to date i still find it very interesting technology i still find it very promising i'm still i still want to look into it myself as well um and in general like the principle behind nfts is just very interesting as a non-fungible token all the all the things you can do with it in terms of real world situations and business models and consumer world it's it's just fascinating you know um 
but from an artist perspective, um, I mean, maybe now is a good time to jump to AI. Um, that's of course all, also very, very interesting, right? Because now that the market, or at least the mainstream, is being saturated with AI art, what impact does that have on NFTs? And and how will how will the NFT world be affected by that moving forward? Will that be positive? Will that be negative? You know, those are questions that are interesting to answer as well. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Like I'm seeing that I could somehow combine AI and NFT, and just AI just creates in NFTs. Any, any thoughts on this? Like, how, how does this affect the NFT space? Also, like, because there could be just like infinite amount of NFT designs, and <coughs> what, um, at, at some point, like, what is the point of all this? I have a hard time answering that question because I'm actually not aware of who buys those. You know, like who collects? <laughs> them. Like, I can't imagine a bunch of uh, high school kids or whatever. Instead of collecting Pokemon cards, they now collect nft and they're like hey look i got this new one it's like oh man this is really rare i wanted that one like i i have a hard time imagining maybe that exists but so i i, I don't know who's collecting them and and how is that community because that's a community thing right like how is it satisfying to pay sometimes a lot of money for something if you then don't show it off to people that you have a certain collection right if if there's nobody else to appreciate it but you, then you know you might as well just have a still image. Why do you need a unique? Um, maybe there's you know just art enthusiasts who want to do something good for artists. That's of course generous and super nice. I don't think there's a lot of those people. So overall, I'm just not really aware like who's who's really you. I'm a bit you and maybe confession that I don't actually own any NFT. And when I learn about NFT space and all of it. I never really understood the point of it. Like I understand it's cool to collect some, something. Like I remember in my youth, I collected Pokemon cards and gathering and, but I always felt like there's something missing in, in the NFT. Like why, why just collect pretty pictures for the sake of it and then pay like hundreds of dollars for each. In my mind, it just didn't kind of make any sense. So I think it's mostly fueled by, by the assumption or the prediction that the price would go up and you make some money out of it. Mm the kind of investment perspective. So to me, I would say that it's the NFT space is probably on the early days that something has to, we have to develop into something a bit more that there's actually more use. Like if, like if, let's think about the collectible card game. And I had this just a kind of analogy in mind that like I understand why it's cool to own something like a rare, let's say Magic the Gathering card that you actually use to, to play the game. And if I would just go online and find the high resolution image of that and print it from my printer like it's not the same thing right? it's, it's not it's not the same it's not the real card right so so mm -hmm. i think that analogy can be used for the nft space but then most of the nfts like they are not used for anything like there's no game to play play with there's no game to use them for and yeah raymond do, did you have we want to follow up yeah, on this? i think you also have to just look at it from a fanatic perspective like let's say somebody is a huge fan of beyonce right and they start buying the fa fashion that fiance buys and they start listening to the albums and they start having posters up the wall then it doesn't really matter if somebody else is not looking at their nfts they're just oh. they're just high in the clouds because they have all nine nfts of beyonce you know what i mean so you know in the end of the day it's also like that that collector drive comes from love and comes from appreciation for something that you deeply enjoy and that you then relate back to yourself so it's not only about getting that dopamine rush of like oh my god look i'm so cool or hey this is my community let's talk about why it is cool that i have ownership of it and that we can celebrate that together it's also possible that you're just in your own little bubble you know and you're like uh stan in a way and, <laughs> and you right yeah. well the, the question is how many stands are there right <laughs> to like really that's make true. it a thing true. But, you know but if you take the example of beyonce for you know one of the biggest stars in the world like then there's probably a lot of stands okay fair enough if you're talking about other Does Beyonce have NFTs. What's that? <laughs> does Beyonce have NFTs? <laughs> I'm pretty sure she does. It would be a very bad marketing move if she didn't. But anyway, um yeah it's a good it's a good thing that uh that you that you say like of course like what if what if it's not beyonce what if 
we're talking about just another artist that is trying to sell their NFTs, then things might need different motivators for them to buy that. Then maybe they do need that community. Maybe they do need that incentive to support an artist. They need different motivators. Yeah, the motivator so far has been, as, as Otto mentioned, uh, to make money, right? Like people had this this Twitter spree exactly. where, where he used to, um, you know, just give people... I, I don't know if you had to like randomly, he randomly picked somebody in his comments or something and then he gifted an NFT and boom, you secured like 50,000 bucks by reselling it or a hundred. Definitely trade. Because it was also in that, in that hype wave, right? Which I'm not sure if it's still as big right now, but uh, you know, for at least six months it was and you'd be lucky and make a ton of money. And that was a proper in incentive to get into. That was something we haven't touched on yet which um, definitely was part of the whole thought bubble of NFTs is the meta universe, right? It's this prediction that we at some point all going to spend a major portion of our time in this virtual space with VR goggles or whatever that, uh, you know, meta created or somebody else. And there, of course, it would matter a lot if you have nfts or not because they now become special items that again you show off to community or you see in a and then you have the same effect like in a mmorpg when you own a very powerful shiny glowing weapon it would be the same same effect right as like or or you know here in real life owning an expensive pairs of shoes and I, f I feel like without that virtual space, NFT just has, just, there's limited uses for limited community. Yeah, these are excellent points. Of course, that the virtual world and the metaverse that might provide a lot of use cases for this technology. And also like what Raymond mentioned is that the aspect of, of a community, like there has to be a group of people who value the NFT collection. So there has to be some sort of emotion, some sort of story, and reason behind it for, for collecting them. And for example, like in, in Finland, where I'm from, like that, that's a popular hobby that people collect is this movie marks, the movie, the cartoon. It's a big thing in Finland to collect them. And I think also Japan, but, but there's again, this community, like there's this, so there's this community, community aspect of wanting to collect a piece of art, but also that art is connected to a cartoon. So it has a bigger story behind it. it it's not just a random mark with a design on it but there's something behind it, like where, where did it come from? So I think probably to have like mainstream NFT that actually people want because of the art, I think there has to be some bigger story behind it, bigger reason. And yeah, I, I think I would now transition us to, to talk a little bit more about the uh, artworks and with Raymond, particularly the, the Komodo art you have been creating. And and also haven't seen like wherever you go to, to check out the Komodo wallet or just Komodo's website, you will see artwork, especially this, what we are calling it, Komodian character. So Raymond, can you tell us a little bit about how did you come up with this, this idea to make the character? How did, how was it born and sure. how you see uh, it going? So just for clarity, uh, the mascot of Komodo currently is the Komodian. And this is derived from a meme that was circulating on Discord or in community channels a long time ago, which was the Komodo Knight. Now, this particular image looked very cute and cell shaded and interesting, and it was adopted by the community as a token of identification with Komodo and what Komodo stands for. And it generated a lot of positive vibes and positive interest. Um, but the image was copyrighted, and that's why it couldn't really be used as much as you know, Komodo platform would like to. So then uh, Otto came up with the idea, why don't we reinvent this image, reappropriate this image in a way that we can use it that is original. So the original Komodo, Komodo knight was a medieval knight, basically. And that's how I started my sketching phase. So I created a few sketches based on that image. And then like something already felt a little bit off, like the sketches were pretty cool, but and then somebody from the Komodo team was like, well, look, why don't we introduce a little bit of sci-fi to it? Why don't we make it a little bit like a stormtrooper, or you know? And, and this was an idea that, that I was already playing with as well in my head because I just, felt, I just felt that manifesting in me, that vision. 
and it just made a lot of sense. So now we have a Komodian, which is basically like a little lizard or a Komodo dragon, right? Uh, very cute, very kawaii. And it has a stormtrooper, not, not really a stormtrooper, but it's like sort of like an astronaut slash foot soldier slash stormtrooper slash um, engineer slash scientist. Like all those ingredients kind of represent Komodo in its own right. And that's sort of like what I try to blend into into the uh, into the Komodian. And that's basically the 3D Komodian mascot that we have today, which I've been using in a lot of art and a lot of blog posts and a lot of animations. And so far, it seems that that's appreciated and celebrated. And that's basically the story behind the Komodian. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool story. I remember, yeah, it goes way back in the early days of Komodo, like when, when we found that Knight character that, that was got some use, but then, yeah, we found out there was copyright indeed, and then we kind of couldn't really use it in in, a, in our website and as well, like in, in that form. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how, where, where this thing goes, and at the moment, uh, little inside info, but, but yeah, we are going to be enhancing the, the designs and looking over all of this, so, so everyone can look into the the new designs from Raymond and the rest of the design team to see what they they come up with but I think it's um it's going to an excellent direction and I really enjoy the Komodian artwork that you're making Raymond and I think so does the the community cool and yeah anyone has any thoughts on this or ideas for Raymond just drop by our discord and tag Raymond let let him know about uh, what you would like to see in terms of design and art if you have some idea in your head that would you would like to be implemented and uh, well Papua you are you are not working for Komodo but uh, but I also wanted to ask you on, on your art project and and perhaps there's something dear to you and your heart that that you have created that you would like to, to kind of give a shout out about or talk about um to be honest none particular <laughs> like what I'm working on right now like can't talk about but uh the art I've created so far to be honest it I never really found the time um amused to like really pursue a particular subject like as a comparison like great artists like frank frazetta or a designer like scott robertson who really dived into like a specific shape language and went down all the different avenues and and developed it into their own style as people say um i never did that because um it was all about getting a, a portfolio that's uh, would get you a job and ma in making portfolio pieces um, instead of like really diving into a world and and fully flesh it out it was more like um, opening a window to that world peeking in and so I made all kinds of different pieces you know ranging from uh, some Egyptian stuff to to some fantasy medieval stuff back to wild western stuff uh, you know sometimes inspired by a book sometimes inspired by a movie but uh i never like really got into like a specific subject that i could call my baby that i could present now you know <laughs> but i hope to at some point yeah perhaps in the in the future <laughs> all right well it's it's time to start to wrap up the, the conversation here i really right. enjoyed in total talk and so we did talk a lot about uh, AI and NFTs and, uh, and the art. I would like to just give you guys the final chance for final words. Anyone, you, anything you want to share? Maybe something that left unsaid that you would still like to chime in on. And then also yeah. be sure to tell us about if you have a website or a social media handle or, or something, uh, art profile, let, let us know how to find that. Yeah, I still want to just, if it's okay, like share a reflection I have. And there's not a particular point, perhaps, but I just want to share a reflection. So, for example, um, in a world that is right now being flooded with all this amazing AI art, right? And this, like, super impressive AI art and, like, huge quantity of it, you know? Like, can we still be original as artists? And also, can we still be original and successful as NFT artists, you know? It's like definitely also a question that's on my mind, you know, because as the quality increases, as the quantity increases, what are the implications of all that? If everybody can create a Mona Lisa, you know, where do we, where does that leave the world, so to speak? So um, as I'm thinking about this question, 
I also have to realize that as this art explosion is saturating our minds in a way, it's also like we are training with that as well. You know, we are basically consuming all that and our minds are like novelty seeking machines. So either way, like as the quality and the quantity increases, we will still be out automatically probing uniqueness. We will still be out on the lookout for uniqueness and for value, you know? So it's like, there is this sentiment of like, oh yeah, all AI art, even though it looks amazing, it has this same-ish value. It's like, we cannot help but look for that which obstructs that and which, that which will compensate for that. So I think there's always an opportunity, no matter how saturated art gets, that we can contribute with our unique voice and that people are able to spot uniqueness and value even if we're, in a manner of speaking, drowning in a sea of AR, AI beauty, you know? So I think that finding your own voice um, will express itself naturally also because you are aware of the AI art that's out there. So as I said, the mind is a novelty seeking machine. So you will also automatically want to do something different. And that which you will then add is gonna be the value that you contribute to the world. And in that respect, I don't fear AI. I still think there's a lot to be said about the human component and about humanity in all of this. And that's just um, something I would like to say to not make everything too post-apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also believe that we naturally starting to balance out all the digital components in our lives because tactile things and tactile products they didn't go away you know like if anything they got an upsurge um you know handmade products uh, out of wood out of metal like they're bigger than ever you know um people do like that balance they do see and start to appreciate more the the value of also tactile things and it might be that that uh artists will get pushed a little more back into the traditional space if they really want to keep it as a profession because yeah there might not be enough of a difference for a digital painter with uh, compared to ai art even if you do unique things i think at some point like right now yes but in 10 years 15 years when you know ai becomes really sophisticated also in the making of it and it's not just a slot machine anymore, as Ramon described earlier, but you can really be more of a sophisticated art director. It may become more and more difficult to to shine with your uniqueness if you're a pure digital painter. And it could be that that's going to push people more back into the traditional space. But I think that one is not going to go away. It didn't go away so far. Digital art has been around for a long time and people are still drawing on paper, they're still painting on paper. Um, I think that's here to stay and people still appreciate it. And, uh, and I think we also can't see yet which doors that AI art will open at some point because I think people are still overwhelmed with the technology, still how to use it, how to, <laughs> how to legalize it, how to work around the copyright and all that. So there might be possibilities that open up after a while that we can't foresee right now that might be really great so yeah it stays yeah it stays I, I wanna i wanna second that you know i think it's very foolish to sort of resent or push against evolution i very much welcome ai actually because i think it is a natural evolution in every sense of the word and you know if you address the elephant in the room general ai i mean things gonna get really wild uh, i mean i'm excited about it you know I just think that the how matters, you know, are we going to let this be a meteor that's crashing down or are we going to gently lift ourselves to a new equilibrium? You know, we have to consider the how. The how is the foundation of what it means to live a life. And that's just the one thing that we have to address, the responsibility of the how. So that's my only concern. My concern is not AI. My concern is the how. Yeah, good thoughts. And I would also, also second what, what you guys said. I think there's always room on the market for talent. And if there's a designer who's really talented, then he, he's going to have demand for his 
skills and services. And I would see like if if I'm a, like I'm an individual, I appreciate handmade real things, not artificial like even furniture. Like I want I want real wood. So there are people who are willing to pay, pay the premium for things like that. And it's mm-hmm. just I think the the top skilled artists just have to find a way to perhaps reach that new audience that that they need to sell their services to. So there might be some disruption in, when it comes to who's going to hire them. But I think there's there's going to be people willing to hire and looking for real art and uh, carefully crafted designs over the average generations of AI that, like Raymond says, is more like a slot machine <laughs> where, where, where users get design after design, but none of them is perfect. They are all kind of okay. Yeah, so with that, uh, do we still have any... Do we want to share website or social media handle or anything how people will find you uh you can look at my art at artstation slash ramonster42 um and you can also see my art at komodo platform and on youtube that's pretty much it. <laughs> you can find mine on uh, artstation as well just search for fabio venet c-e-n-e-t-z and i'm on instagram as well on the same name and it was a lot of fun talking about this thank you guys yeah this was great yeah yeah, th- thanks all for joining Raymond and Fabio. Thank you for listening to the Voices of Komodo. We welcome your ideas for future episodes. You can drop by our Discord and say hello. Remember, sign up for updates and get our starter resource at komodoplatform.com slash guide. Enjoy the rest of your morning or evening wherever you might be.